is the main beginning. This main beginning is Jesus Christ. The image of God, calling Scripture the Son of God. Now, unless this Christ is in us, is willing to have a call in my life, then God cannot go through this purpose. Now, listen to these words carefully. From a little boy lost by William Blake. He said, Not love the mother as itself, nor venerate another self. Nor is it possible to thought a greater than itself to know. And Father, how can I love you, or any of my brothers more? I love you like a little bird that picks up sun along the door. If God wants me to know him as he is, he will have to raise me to the level of his own being. I must become God to know God. If he would have me venerating, he has to raise me to the level of himself. If he would have me love, then he would have to bring me up to the level of God. And the soul of God is love. So I did not possibly know God, love God, venerate God, unless I am God. If it is as I am, like a little bird around the door of God, that's the only love I can show for God. That's the only respect I can have for So there's a main email that is God. And that one has to be raised to the level of God. So God becomes that, that man may become God. So we are told we are destined in love to be the Son through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. So the office of trust in the gospel is that men may become the sons of God through grace, by union with him who is the son of God by nature. This is spoken of in scripture as rebirth, not reincarnation, rebirth. A higher level, and a still higher level. And here we have the discussion taking place in the third chapter of the book of John. It's introduced out of the book. Nothing leads up to it. He suddenly turns to a member of the same Hebrew, the highest body in the Hebrew world. And he said to him, You must be born again. The word translated again <coughs> for a new means literally from above. It's anothin, the Greek word anothin. You must be born from above. Unless you are born from above, you cannot think of the kingdom of God. And he who heard it wondered, How did I am a No, man. Once more you enter my mother's womb and be born again. And he said, You are master of Israel, and yet you do not know that unless you are born from above, you cannot see the kingdom of God. It is not explained when you hear it. My word is this is in priest and rabbis discussing. And they say, You mean it's a change of attitude, a change of this, a change of that. May I tell you, it is literally true. You are born from above. I speak from experience. I am not speculating. I am not theorizing. I had no idea this thing was so literally true. But man contains within himself this seed that is Christ. He is called the Word of God, and the Word is called the seed. And there are three stages in the history of the seed. There is the sowing, there is the dying, and then there is the picking. The seed is sown at the land. The land grows it with faith. And then it's planted, it's sown. Man goes through the fires of hell in this world here. And that is the dying. 
the sea was fall into the ground and die before it is made alive. If it does not die, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much. It's the great mystery of life through death. For the sea falls itself. Then it dies, and then it rose. It's quickened. And this is the sea called the Word of God. That is Jesus Christ. Who's actually in it. So you've heard the story of God. You've heard the story of the God. You either accept or you reject. But a number of chances will be given you to hear it and to accept. Because you must accept it eventually that God's purpose be fulfilled. So everyone will one day completely accept it. And the acceptance will then be him prove that he can be raised from the level where he accepted it up to the level where the sea will take him, which is God himself. So God becomes man, that man may become God. So here, I have told you in my own way, everyone will tell it as he himself experienced it. With different people, it appears differently, but everything else does in this world. So here is one from the south, in LA, how it came in his case. I am very eager to get everyone to share with me their visions and their dreams, because God speaks to men through the medium of the dream and unveils himself through the medium of a vision. But he finds himself at the base of a great tree. And then a winding road leading up, and here at the top of this winding road is an enormous dog. And the dog is barking at him. But he knows the dog can eat it and will not because he is held by his train. The train has no outline of a man, but with a radiant light, a fiery light. And he knows it is free in his region. The man takes the dog on the leash and brings him down and passes this man who is at the base of the tree. When he gets beyond, he uses the dog, but he himself returns to the man at the base of the tree and fuses with him. This radiant fiery being enters him and becomes him. And then he, still not quite sure of the dog, moves by the lightning up this winding pathway, and when he arrives at the very top, he says, At last I am in the top room. The dog comes up and licks his face. And then he wakes. This is also told us by the poet Francis Thompson, called the Hungry Dead. I chased him down the nights and down the years. Down through the arches of the years. Through the labyrinthine ways of my own mind, he paints this fantastic picture of the hum, the pursuit of God. But when he comes to the end of the poem, he now takes the rest. And the voice speaks silently, speaks. And he says, Ah, Bountis, blindest weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. Thou gravest thou from thee who gravest me. Now you and I are seeking God. And we go into a number of blind areas. You think you can find him through God, through meditation, through drawing a certain ego, through doing this, that, and the other. All these are the blind areas. For the one who are seeking is within, unless you believe that I am he, you die in your sins. I can tell you now to the ends of time, that those say I am that God, and there never was another, and never will be another. But can I persuade you? Can I persuade you to stop looking on the outside for what is within? That man within that is I am. I can talk to my friends of time in the hope that I will get you at least to try. But I can say that I have succeeded. You and you alone, like my friend who had this vision, who's been coming for years. This happened here recently. He suddenly began to actually accept the fact that it really moves within. And what seemed to come from without did penetrate him and abide now within him. So the flame took up the place within himself. I call you flame. And now you're no longer a servant 
seeking on the outside. Now he is found in, on the inside. So here this man, this man of the living, that we speak of as Jesus Christ, I will only be born from above if I am joined in supernatural union to him who is the Son of God by nature. So when I stood in his presence, it's a sexual union. I don't be embarrassed, we all have it. It's not a sexual union. You feel no sexual act. But the most fantastic sexual act in the world is that it's nothing compared to the ecstasy of the embrace of the Son of God when he embraces you. When you stand in his presence and he asks you the simplest question in the world, to name the greatest thing in the world, and whether you knew it prior to that moment or not, you will enter automatically for your pulpit in Scripture. And you will just say, faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. At that moment, he embraces you. And in the you actually become one love, one spirit. At that moment, you will have had union with the risen Lord. Now, the seed that I can take within myself bears my image. Find the appropriate soil in which to plant it, and it will grow into the likeness of myself, and into the statement. You take a sucker from a plant, privately it from the plant, it participates in the life of the plant. But you take it from the plant and transplant it. It becomes in its turn the bird. So the seed of God is planted in man, and that seed is called Jesus Christ. It bears the express image of his person. So the seed comes to the womb, which is man. By man, I mean generic man. It comes in the form of a stone, which is the story of the gospel, which is the story of God. He desires to raise us to the level where we can appreciate it, where we can venerate him, where we can understand it. But I can understand him on my present level as he ought to be understood. But to go back to the point, not loves another as itself. I think I could sacrifice myself tonight for someone I would really do. For my daughter, my wife, my friends, at my age, what does it matter? If I was given no choice but either your life or her life, no. I don't think I would hesitate for a second to say, well, take this. But it doesn't mean because I gave my life to save my wife or my daughter or my friends that I really truly, in the depths of my soul, love them more than I do myself. Not loves another as itself. Nor venerates another self. Nor is it possible to thought of greater than itself to love. And Father, how can I love you or any of my brothers more? How can I love you like a little bird? that picks up crumbs around the door. You want me to venerate you, but then raise you. You want me to really understand you and know you, but then raise me to the level of your own being. Then I can really love you. Because I can't love anything in this fabulous world as I love myself. If you are big enough to admit it, you'll admit it. If you say, oh no, I love God more than I love myself, then define me for me. And you'll give me some monstrous things I know full well you couldn't possibly love. You're going to paint something that is not God at all. But God reveals himself to man with image of his own wonderful I am. Go and tell him, I am as Satan will be. That's my name forever. And by this name I shall be known throughout all generations. When I've been found into me as I am. I think the day will come you will find him just as I am. And his son will stand before you and call you Father. When the son calls you Father, and you know the truth of this relationship, then you will find God. For so there is no other love. So he sets up in the beginning that which, when it occurs in you, reveals to you that you and the one who called God are one. Until it happens, you will not know truly that you are God. And you know the truth of the visions of these men of the blade and the Thompson. 
and you will not be cynical about it. You won't touch it. You will admit it. Are you well about it? Do you think it's possible for thought a greater than itself to know? Can it? Do you really believe that you, the individual that is not, that you can venerate someone more than the being that you really are? That it's possible to love another more than love self? I tell you, you develop on it and you'll prove you frank with yourself. I'm honest, and your answer is the right thing. Well, now, I admit that there is a presence that created it all. I am relative to this presence, like the little bird who runs the door. But I would like to know him. I'd like to know him so I can show my appreciation, my love, for then raise me. Raise me up to your level, I may know you as you are. Raise me up to your level, I may know you as you ought to be better than Raise me up. That I may love you as you ought to be loved. And so he has a plan. God chose us in him before the foundation of the world and destined us in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Through Jesus Christ. Well, now that's the seed. He tells us that this is the word of God and the word is the seed. And the seed is planted on man. And man becomes the soil to receive that seed. And he receives it, and then it dies. It dies in him. He walks the earth when he wills the ones I'm supposed to find. And suddenly it erupts with him. And that moment of eruption, no one knows when it's going to happen. It's like a woman taken at the very last moment. She doesn't know it. And suddenly she gives birth. A man is then born from above. From that moment on, you see everything different. You see God in an entirely different life. No longer on the outside. You come to you come to the end. And you can tell others, and they are to among the others that you speak to, who will call you mad or call you blasphemous. It doesn't mean really that to you. You only have to accept it. They may turn from you and say he is the most angry person I've ever met. It's perfectly all right. Because when you find it true and you know in your heart, that they will have it too. And when they have it, you will be far removed from them in time and space. But eventually, you will meet. There will be no bragging, no boasting, because you preceded them into the kingdom. Because in the kingdom, you all are equal. So when they come, they come as brothers. And then you will know the words, nor love a brother more. When you come, because he's had the same experience that he's found God. And he's found himself in finding God. And you found yourself in finding God, then you are one. Then you know the words of God. And I dwell in thee, <coughs> and they dwell in me. And we are one, God, as you and I are one. And may they know that you save me, and love them as thou lovest me. Only one. So here this man with him, you actually feel him. And you find them. Although you're clothed thereafter in the same arm of the flesh, and you answer to the name that all know you by, so they call you John and you respond. But you know, in your heart of hearts, you really are. But in the world of Caesar, you tell a name. And the name is John, or the name is Mary, or any other name. And to that name, you, re you respond. But within yourself, having had the experience, you know who you are. And those who come to you, you also know that you couldn't possibly come unless the call of the thing you call them. And so you're calling one after one after one because they're all beginning to wait when they're coming to you. Or if you have awakened, then those who you are calling are on the verge of waiting. So I can say in my number down in LA that dozens and dozens are having the experience of the birth of the birth. So they will be Monday and Friday or night and night. And in that audience, Dozens, perhaps. But they have it differently, as they have everything else to do. We all are unique in this world, so the birth is the same. But when it takes place, the symbolism alters somewhat. The energy changes somewhat. But it's all towards the end of the awakening and the unfolding of the God within us. 
when we have found Christ in you, it is the hope of love. It's an actual fact that we have Christ in you as the hope of love. Now, in scripture, when I tell Matt Ministry, God has increased the story. You look at me and tell, what on earth did you ever study? Where is your theology? Did you go to any college to study it? For I never heard that in school when I studied theology. But as far as I am concerned, it is not from my study of the book. I never heard it from a man, never read it in the book. It came by revelation. If it doesn't fit what you heard, I would ask you to consider it anyway. Because you have heard it from a man. How do you know what you heard from men in his revelation? Could it not be the traditions of men? There are men sat down to conceive and compose what they consider a workable philosophy of life. And this they consider the master. And then they gave it out as vision. But it isn't vision at all. I am telling you what I have actually said by revelation. By revelation, I mean God unveiling himself seen me as me. And so, but I tell you that Jesus Christ is God the Father. You will say that he is God the Son. I am telling you he is God the Father. And as God the Father, he has to have a Son. For he would not be a Father without a Son. And then you say that Jesus Christ has no Son. He is the Son of God. And I tell you he is God himself. And God being a Father, he has to have a Son. Now I tell you his Son is. And this always started. His son is David. David of difficult things. That's the son of the Lord Jesus Christ. They go through the ceiling. They're sort of afraid of what I'm talking about. When I turn to Scripture, I think, now to whom are these words addressed? They're taken from the second psalm. And David said, I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, Thou art my son. Today I will be gotten free. You want to know where you find it? In the second psalm, the seventh verse. There you find it. Written 1,000 years B.C. There is a blueprint of what man is going to experience. For the whole story is the story of Christ. So the whole thing is foreclosed until the time is fulfilled when God begins to live with you man. When God is a father, but it shall be his son. It stated in the second psalm who his son must be when he appears to be in God to man. And he appears in man. Now, in the book of Luke and Matthew, there was no reason to bring up, if you read the chapter carefully, to the previous chapter of the book of Luke, or the previous second of the book of Matthew. And here they were starting something entirely different. The Pharisees said to him, Master, Moses in the law said that if a man marries and dies leaving the offspring, and he has a brother, the brother should marry the widow and raise up offspring for the brother. For there were seven brothers. One married, the first married, and he died leaving no offspring. The second took her, and he died leaving no offspring. And the third took her, and he eventually all married her, and finally all died and she died. And there was no offspring. Tell me, whose wife is she in the resurrection? Now, the question was asked by the Sadducees. We are told the Sadducees were, of the ancient world, what the modern agnostic or atheist or the extreme scientist who was looking for tangible proof of the existence of God or something in man that could survive creation. If you make the body and you sit there and you ask, what on earth will survive that? So the mind who entertains that thought is called the Sadducee in Scripture. Not believing the way that I really ask the question. <clears throat> and this is the answer. The sons of this age marry, and they are given in marriage. But those who are come to work to attain to that age and to the resurrection, from the dead, they neither marry nor are they given in marriage, for they can die no more. They are now sons of the resurrection, therefore sons of God. In Christ, until that takes place in man, man as he appears to die isn't really dead. He is restored to life to continue the journey 
and he dies again. He saw it, he gives it here, and he dies again. Not reincarnation, not what the world talks about reincarnation, but simply restoration continues his body just like this, just as before. In a world where I still death like this, aging death as we do here, maybe I will depart it from that world to do here. But that world is part of this world. He only speaks of two ages. So my world here does not terminate at the point where my senses need to register. So I need someone, this very moment is not dead. I go to get to room and see the dust. They gave me a little urn. She was turning into us, little ashes. But I can't touch her now. I can't talk to her. I can't see her. But that world does not end. It doesn't terminate. At that point in time where my senses need to register. She has been stored in a body just as before. You, not a baby, but you, now. Not a thing missing, it's time to come to you. She continues the journey, and she knows, as she did here. And she lives a life there, as she was with her. And she matures and knows how, as she dies there, as she dies here. To find herself to be stored once there, to continue the journey, just as before. No loss of identity. Then comes the moment in God, where man is born from above. As he's born from above, he goes through a series of events, leading up to the discovery of the fatherhood of God as he himself. Then he can be part of this age forever. He no longer will be stored to life, when men call him dead. He has entered the kingdom of God, and his body is not the body of flesh and blood, for it cannot enter the kingdom of God. That body is the body of glory. His immortal body that cannot die. Everyone has that body awaiting the discovery of the fatherhood of God. And he deposited it in himself when God's Son calls him God. Now, after the discussion with the Sadducees, he brings up a point, and it's not at all related to the chapter, either the 22nd of Matthew or the 20th of Luke, where you find the story. After he answered the Sadducees, he then asked the question, What think ye of the Christ? Whose son is he? For tradition has it that he was the son of David. So then, the son of David. Then he comes back and says, And why then did David in the Spirit call him Lord? If David does call him my Lord, how can he be David's son? So he just comes to the fact that he is David's son. He doesn't tell him. But he does tell him, David called him my Lord. Well, the ancient son always spoke of his father as my Lord. Always referred to his father as my Lord. So he's telling you in his own, in his own wonderful mystical way who David is relative to him. David is his son. That he set up in the beginning, in that second song, David calls him father. The 89th Psalm, he makes the statement, I have come to you, and he has cried unto me, Thou art my son, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Now these are mysteries, but the mysteries of Scripture are not matters to be kept secret. They are truths that are mysterious in character. So when you read and you take it as secular history, you'll never get the point. Read it carefully, dwell upon it, and try to understand what is he trying to get at in this point. But he's trying to be who he is. He tells now in the book of John, when someone said to him, Philip said to him, Master, or that he calls him Lord, he says, Show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. He said, I have been so wrong with you, yet you do not know me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. How then can you say, Show us the Father? He tells you he's the Father. In spite of that, after 2,000 years of theology, which I hope is not the really theology that you say to the world, which is the knowledge of God, is what the world is not, it is nothing more than the traditions of men. Men have a certain set concepts of what God ought to have done, and included it as theology. Ordaining people is not based upon the truth of Scripture. The Sunday came to me once, it's about six weeks ago. At the end of the meeting, she came forward and said, I will take your theories under consideration. I said, thank you very much. Then she said to me, you know, I am an ordained minister. 
and we're free now. So are you ordained as they're not by men? No. And they'll be you ordained by men, won't you? She said, by a minister. I don't know him. Oh, yes, well, he was a man. And you call him a minister. Well, he was a minister, he's a man. <coughs> then he tells you, they're not here. We can look at my theories under consideration. I speak from experience. I'm not spectacular. I'm not fearless. I am telling you what I know from experience. And that is a man who knows from experience. He knows more first than he knows anything else in this world. Or than he can know that same thing in the other world. Now, you heard me tonight, and you call it a theory. You can't deny that you heard it, therefore, you can say, well, I know what you said. But you know it as Hare said. You don't know it from experience. The day will come, you will know what I'm saying to be true, because you will know it from experience. Until you have experienced it, it is still only to hear. Something that someone said, and it's Hare said. So you will go home and take it under consideration, or you don't take it under consideration. And one day, in God's infinite mercy, He will unveil Himself within you, and you will find that you, in spite of your present sex, you will be God the Father. And He will not embarrass you, although you now wear the garment of a woman, to find that you are really the eternal man. And that eternal man is God. God is man. I'm telling you, I know that from his presence. You stand in the presence of infinite love and his man. He wants me to know him, all right, raise me as that same man. Don't leave me on the level of the bird, where I can only see you through the eyes of the bird, and be satisfied with the crown, not knowing as you throw the crumbs out, that you will live to even get the crumbs. I eat the crumbs, I'm not even great before. I take them because there they are. And you gave me the appetite of the bone to eat them. So I eat them. But I do not know where they came from. And I'm not concerned. I'm a bird. So we go to the field. And we meet our hearts. And we don't even know how it came to be. We see each other with the corn, the sort of air corn. We do not know the mystery behind the growth of the corn. And so I cannot know that the way of it is left to build the corn. And then I will know. Until then, I am simply the bird, feeding on the arms along the door. For not can know, and not loves another, as itself, nor venerates another self. Nor is it possible for thought a greater than itself to know. So far we want me to know you, lift me up. For he is made friend. The plan is contained in what he calls Jesus Christ. He has made known unto me the purpose, his prayer, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. What well, if Christ is in us, or then the plan is in us? For he said he set forth the plan in Christ for the fullness of time. So when that time comes, then it erupts, and the shell is broken, and all that is contained in the plan comes forward in a first person present tense experience. And then we know who we are. Then it doesn't matter after that thing we you part this life. Whether we go this moment or ten years from now, it doesn't really matter. We feel like talk. I wish I could moment after moment we part with you. I desire to be part and be with Christ. That's far, far better. But for your sakes, it is better that I remain and tell you the word of God. But he desired to depart. Having fulfilled scripture, what else can we do? There's not a thing in this world for man to do but to fulfill scripture. Not to build in the same time for all things that, but to fulfill scripture. So when scripture is fulfilled in them, there's not a thing left but to tell it. And you'll find those who are eager to hear it, those who will turn a deaf ear to it, but it doesn't really matter. In the fullness of time, those who don't turn their back to God will eagerly eat it. And then it will come. Someone else will carry on. And they will plant the seed and they will pick it up. So there, this man within is the same man spoken of in Scripture that carries the plan of God, pattern. And that is Christ Jesus. Christ in us is the hope of glory. 
And so he maintains the pattern. He is the pattern man. So Paul in his letter to Timothy, he said, Hold fast the pattern of the true word which you heard from me. For he told the story as he himself experienced it. And he said it in Galatia. And said, If any man changes one word, then let him be a poet. For this is not something I composed, this is something that came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. I didn't hear it from a man. I wasn't told by a man. It came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I am telling who you really are. You are God. He loved to the level of the birth, feeling you down. But within you is a pattern. And that pattern is contained in the seed of God. And that seed is Jesus Christ. Then it must the seed of God in the true sense of the word as my spirit contains my image. And from the other womb in which place my image will come out and be projected on the spirit space. For God found in us the proper womb and he buried through Jesus Christ his son. So I say it is his purpose, his office, to actually turn me into sons of God by grace, through union with him, who is the Son of God by nature. There is a perfect seed of God called Jesus Christ. Buried in me, it sort of takes a graft, and like the little supper of the plant, although it lives upon the tree until detached and partakes of the life of the tree, when once detached and transplanted, it becomes in each turn the parent. So he takes his seed and transplants it, engrafts it into man. And then that, that transplant, then, in its good time, becomes the parent. And the parent is God the Father. And therefore, the same son that calls you Father must call me Father. Then I will go by me, and there is no other way of No one knows who the Father is but the Son. And no one knows who the Son is but the Father. For if no one in this world knows who the Son is but the Father, so then show me my Son. Show me my Father. And when He comes, I'm here. So the Old Testament ends upon the note. If a son honors his father, and I am a father, where is my honor? If a son honors his father, and I am a father, where is my honor? In other words, where is my son? You read that in the first chapter of the last book of the Old the book of Malachi. Where is my son? Now you turn over the pages, and the New Testament gives the answer. So here is the son, and he comes. But the whole book was a seal book, completely sealed, and no one knew how to break the seal. For it's broken from the deed, it's not broken from the dark. So this being of whom I speak, which is the being that you have heard time and time again as something external to yourself is really the seed of God, the sperm of God, planted in you. And therefore, if Mary carries the sperm of God to bear this heavenly creature, then you must be Mary. For you're carrying the sperm of God. And so in this very body, I don't mean this body of flesh and blood, but in that something with you, I bear and have born the Son of God. He came out the so he born and called me God. Now let us go into the sun. So are there any questions, please? First of all, let me uh, repeat what I said earlier. A lady asked for a copy of that message from the doctor. Which I copied and left with my wife at the door two nights ago, but it hasn't picked up. If you are here tonight, you asked me to copy it for you. And I did. So, you find me at the desk. If you are here tonight. question was, is it necessary to understand all these things intellectually before you have these phrases? 
No. I do know that a hunger comes upon a man, but only the springs of God can satisfy. When that hunger comes, well, nothing, nothing deserts you. And you'll find that Jesus in God's book called the Bible that no one else seems to see. Others try to sell. You find these ladies on the street in their road, drawn to a certain order. They always have a Bible in their hand, but it's closed. In New York City, they're riding the subway, they have the Bible in their hand. They think that's the Word of God, and they carry it as with a piece of paper. What do they know about the thing that is contained in the book? But you don't carry it that way, you go home and you read it. I spend six and seven hours a day, seven days a week, reading my Bible. The only 66 books of it, but I never tire of it. I never tire of it. I brought two books there. When I went to New York City last summer, I carried two books. I went to Barbados for three months, I carried the same two books. One was the Bible, and one was the complete works of bread. That's all that I carried. And I found in these two a library. First of all, there are many books in the complete works of bread, and there are 66 books in the Bible. But well, that's a nice library. But you don't have to know the intellectual. It just happens, it comes. And when it blows upon you, the whole vast world will rise in opposition and it makes no difference to you whatsoever. Now, you know what has happened and you can't undo it. And you also know that all the world will not undo what God has done you. And you have a choice. It doesn't really matter what God can give you. They can't undo, not in eternity, what God has done in you. And you're told, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. When? At the day of Jesus Christ. At the unveiling of Christ with the Lord. Any other questions, please? A fish coming out of the water and embraces someone? Well, first of all, the fish has always been the symbol of Christ. Water has been the symbol of truth, psychological truth. And so if the fish comes up, man, I would say, has ceased to apply it psychologically, but it's going to turn it now into wine. As you're told in Timothy, drink no more water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your many infirmities. In other words, it doesn't mean I have to stop drinking water. But there are three symbols of truth. First is the stone. That's the literal fact that is difficult to digest. Man can't understand it. For the stories are all parables. They're all allegories. And an allegory or a parable is a story told as if they were true. Leaving the one who hears it or reads it to discover its fictitious character and learn its lesson. Well, the average person can't break that stone. He can turn it into water and learn the lesson. Now, if I could take a story and give you the psychological meaning so you could apply it towards the world of season, I gave you water. I offer you a glass of water and then you'll try to show you the psychological meaning of the story. But don't stop there. Take it and apply it. You're the awesome power. As you apply it, you're turning the water into water. So it's stone, water, wine. So if this fish comes out, which is a symbol of Christ, and then embraces someone, but he comes out of the water with a normal natural habitat, water being the psychological meaning, now he's coming out into the more living state. That's what I would do to the uh, interpretation of that dream. God speaks to me, to you, and the whole vast world to the meaning of dream. That's told in the twelfth chapter of the book of Numbers. Any other questions, please? You've got the time. Yes, ma'am. To what? The lady had that snakes were chasing her. I know that the lady had a strange concept of dealing to all the snakes. And it goes back to the story in the third chapter of Genesis, where the snake, the wildest of all God's creatures, uh, deceived woman into believing she would not die. 
That's the story of Sarah. For the servants said to her, that God said to you that you would not, that you would die. And she said, yes, if I ate of the serpent tree, the fruit of the serpent tree. And he said, well, God knows you will not really die, but surely die. See, the snake did not deceive her at all. Because if you read the story carefully, you will find that this is said. And God said, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So he did not deceive her. He said you become a dead ox, knowing good and evil. If you did it. And so the snake is not really what the world believes to be, as we're told in the third of uh, John. And as Moses did not the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be the dog. So he identifies himself with the serpent, for he calls himself the Son of Man. And he must be lifted up in the same way that the serpent is lifted up in the wilderness. And that's an actual literal fact. It's the symbol of the Son of Man. But the Son of Man, on certain levels, kills man. If you thought this very moment, that your every thought, your every emotion was exposed to the eye of God, you just killed him dead. You would not believe. But knowing that he can't see, or thinking that he can't see you, you would entertain all the unlovely thoughts of the world. Think that I'm hidden out from the eye of God. But if you actually knew that you're not living at all, you're completely exposed, your every thought, your every mood, to the eye of God. The man wants a shelter from God. For he runs from the serpent. But in the end, you will find that the perfect symbol of the Son of Man. And he has perfect peace. Is there any special significance of seven brothers who married the widow? Seven. Now, seven is the spiritual number of perfection. So, here is seven, it's spiritual perfection. All numbers have significance. And seven is spiritual perfection because on the seventh day, he finished, he rested, satisfied, all that was done. The eighth is a new beginning. Resurrection. So seven, here is the work, it's done. Now who's wife is she? Can you know it? It's all done. The Lord day and she's dead. So I'll give you the answer. <coughs> and he tells them you do not understand scripture. If you understood scripture, you would not have asked. For only in this age do they marry and not live in marriage. Only in this age do they die. When they are saved to that age, which is the resurrection of the day they get married, or are they given in marriage? They are created beings not split into two, male and female. They are man. Man differs from male. Man differs from female. Man is God. Wearing garments of male and female. But man, in the resurrection, is above the organization of sex. He's not a male nor female. He's man. is what of the unnumbered crowds in the world who are not seeking what we here are seeking. But first of all, until the hunger is upon them, they cannot be seeking. No man comes unto me except my father calls him. And when my father calls him, I will not cast him away. Now, the eternal will of the Amos, I will send a hunger, a famine upon the land. There will not be a hunger for bread or a thirst for water but for the healing of the Word of God. And when that hunger is upon you, not a thing in this world can satisfy that hunger, but an experience of God. So until that hunger is upon you, you can put all the things thrown at you of that nature, and it doesn't appeal to you. By going to a restaurant, you have a complete hunger for certain items, and not a thing else on the way you appeal, you want that item. But when the hunger of God is upon you, you only want a piece of it. And he will eat his body and drink his blood. 
And the body, in the physical sense, is that book, the Bible. And you extract it. When you extract the life of it, it brings you blood. And then comes the experience. And you have the experience of God. And you know that everyone will have the vision. But he calls us all in this own good time. One by one by one. As he builds his living temple as a living stone. Life giving space, not just animated bodies. But the world now is all an animated body. We are destined to be life giving space. But there is life in us. So we have a father. That the father has life in himself. So he's going to the son also to have life in himself. And you will be the power animating the world, not being animated by a power external to yourself. Now we have two lectures uh, that we're here tomorrow night and Friday. Same place, same time. Now if you're not on the mailing list, 